One of the most intriguing and often surprising things people notice about Toronto is its moving shoreline. Not moving as in, hey, where's my car? But moving as in, why is that beautiful old building all alone in that really weird spot? Or why in the world is there a street named Harbor Street right here? The Toronto shoreline we all know has been roughly the same for about a century. The Portlands area to the east and some of the makeup of how the islands are laid out has changed during this stint. But the downtown waterfront? Well, let's look at an aerial view from now and then let's look at a nice aerial shot from 1918. Take a look at this building again, the Toronto Harbour Commission building. Now let's go back to an aerial view from now. and. Here it is, hundreds of meters further north, but actually it hasn't moved. The shoreline did. Firstly, let's step back and look at some cool older maps. If you look at the early maps of the city, you can make out the natural shoreline. In this 1788 map, for instance. Wait, 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 let me stop quickly here. These maps I'm showing you right now are beautiful. Please take time to pause this video and look at them. And also, please go to oldtorontomaps.blogspot.ca for a great catalog of old Toronto maps. Now look at this 1817 map, 1834, 1858, 1860, 1902. And now look at this 1947 map of the harbor. It's almost identical to how it is now. And as you can see, here's the Harbor Commission building. Let me briefly digress. If you're interested in learning more about Toronto history, please make sure to subscribe to this channel, share this video, like it, and tell all your friends. Around the 1850s, Polish engineer Sir Casimir Zowski, who was the great-great-grandfather of Peter Zowski, was tasked with working on the Esplanade, which in its early years, in the mid-1800s, ran from Berkeley Street in the east all the way to Brock Street in the west present-day Skydome, yes, Skydome, would have been along it. By the 1870s, people were starting to alter the layout of the shore. The Keating Channel right here was added in the 1890s to connect the Don River in this odd right angle. The actual Toronto Harbour, though, was dominated by industry. Let's take a quick look at what some of the shoreline around the turn of the 20th century looked like. Take a quick look at the change from 1909 until 1918. You'll notice a good amount of change on the west side and east side. The shoreline itself during the late 19th century and very beginning of the 20th was controlled predominantly by private companies and railways. So the outline of the harbor was mostly at the whim of private interests. This would change though. In 1911, Toronto set up the Toronto Harbor Commission, AKA this building. Although this building won't be constructed until 1917, the commission was a joint federal municipal operation in charge of the Toronto waterfront, including the creation of the Toronto Islands Airport here in 1939. In 1912, the commission finished a formal plan for the waterfront named creatively as the Waterfront Plan of 1912. This was arguably the most ambitious plan the city has ever taken on a $19 million project to repurpose the whole waterfront from Victoria Park to the Humber River. It would dredge the harbor and use that dredge fill to fill in the harbor. By the 1920s, the plan was being executed. Look at the Harbor Commission building in 1919 and then in the 1920s. Look at the newly filled in land, barren. To put it into perspective, let's look at Queens Quay and Bay looking west in 1927 and then east. Not exactly pretty. Let's quickly take another look. Front Street here would become Front Street here. They would extend the harbor in some places by 500 meters or so. But why? Well, the plan was to push for Toronto to become a larger destination for shipping and other industry. But if you look at the use of the extra land through the decades, you will see a remarkably underused space. 
Here is a good example of the similarities from 1947 until now. Almost identical. So, the pristine and untouched water and shoreline that existed 200 years ago would go on to become heavily polluted with sewage and industry, which would lead to some changes of the layout and planning of the harbor, which would lead to the city looking to develop it even further, until what we have today. But as the city ebbs and flows with how they want the shoreline to look, an interesting thing keeps happening. The development of structures this past few decades has often dredged up what was there before. Because when they filled in the lake in the 1920s, they simply covered things up. Old ships, the wharves, and according to York University archivist Michael Moyer, for years the harbor was used as a dumping ground. One standard practice was to take your deceased horses and leave them on top of the ice there, having them sink once thawed, which is likely a fact some of the city's developers would wish I had left out of this video. So the next time you're driving along Harbor Street, realize anything south of you was the lake. Next time you stand here out front of the old Harbor Commission building, now a steakhouse, realize that a century ago in 1919 sat a German World War I submarine, a U-boat. They're on a US victory lap after the war. Or that this guy paddling here was only about 20 meters south of you. What do you think should be done about the Toronto waterfront? It's been a topic of worry and opportunity for years. If you're interested in learning more, make sure to check out waterfrontforall.ca. It's an advocacy group made up of different organizations, all working hard to make sure the will of the city is listened to.